Good evening, everybody. Tonight's talk is one of a series that we've been running with Rosie Goldsmith. Um, it's a series entitled Fashion and Fiction, and the title gives you a pretty clear idea of what it's about. She interviews very well-known writers and talks to them about their love of clothes and some of the ways in which clothes and dress have inspired both their writing and other aspects of their lives and their work. Um, tonight's speaker, uh, we're very delighted and very honored to welcome back to the Victoria and Albert Museum, is Jung Chang. Um, I need say very little by way of introduction. Uh, she's known all over the world. Um, I understand that Wild Swan's, her first book, is the book that's most widely read outside of China about or relating to China. Since then, she's also published on Mao and the Empress Sisi, the last dowager empress of China. Some of her books are on sale outside, so please do take the opportunity to look at them. And if you're interested, she will be remaining for 10 or 15 minutes after the lecture to sign a few copies. Before we welcome uh, Jung Chang and Rosie Goldsmith officially, could I please ask you, first of all, to turn your phones either to silent or off so that they don't go in the middle of the event. And also to remind you that we don't allow flash photography during the event. So if you wouldn't mind restraining yourselves, someone is filming the event so you will be able to see it again on video online. You don't need to make a recording yourself. And I'm sure if you want to take a couple of photos afterwards, you can ask Yung Chang and she may agree to that. So without further ado, will you please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Rosie Goldsmith interviewing Jung Chang. Um, I just want to give a very brief introduction and um, you'll see one thing which is rather extraordinary, I think, is that I'm actually wearing the Chinese dress and Jung Chang is not. <laughs> so, <laughs> but this is actually, it's a real one and it's worn in honour of her and, honor, and in honour of tonight. Now tonight, once again, I'm uh, combining several of my great passions under one roof, and that is fashion, it's fiction, or good writing, and in fact the Victoria and Albert Museum itself. And also, um, I'm very happy to have the, the work and the person of, of Yong Chang. Now, as Joe described fashion and fiction, it's a series of interviews with, with great writers, and if you think that costume and clothing have been integral to narrative and to character across cultures and across the centuries. And if you just think of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales or Maupassant, um, um, Madame Bovary, and then you've got um, Anna Karenina, and you've got the great Gatsby, of course, and in our day, we've got Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall. Now, this is a really unexplored dressing up box of, um, of, fa of fashion and fiction, and it's been unexplored up until now, so I'm really delighted about this series. And we've had Margaret Atwood and uh, Linda Grant, and we've ha uh, we have Joanna Trollope and uh, Sarah Dunant next year. Now, I call these writers my uh, fashion and fictionistas, um, and one of the most remarkable writers in this whole pantheon is Yong Chang, and she's also one of the, the most fashionable writers I've ever met. Um, now, Wild Swans, as you know, is an autobiographical history, and we'll be talking about that. Um, it was an extraordinary achievement, um, as was Mao, the unknown story, and um, Empress Dowager Seishi. We'll be talking about all those books in the context of costume and, and clothing. Um, they're thrilling because these are Yong Chang's personal experiences in many cases. The Wild Swans, as you know, was autobiographical, as I say, it was about her family, about her grandmother, her mother, and herself. It was about her life growing up in China in the 1950s as a child and later during the Cultural Revolution. Now, reading her histories um, and interviewing her, as I've had the pleasure to do over the years, um, I've really been struck by the detailed description she has of, of clothing and costume and accessories and the details of ceremonial and, and peasant life and underwear and makeup and things like that. And what they say about China's identity and the changing identity 
of China. So I was really pleased when she agreed to talk about this and to give us her unique personal costume history of China. It's for the very first time, and I'd like to welcome Yong Chang to the stage. <laughs> Now, Jung, did you realise until I told you how much you'd actually written about clothing and accessories? You, you're an historian, you're a very serious writer, and you write history books. And when I came along and said to you, would you please do a talk about fashion and writing, you were a bit surprised, I think. Uh, well, I mean, uh, yes, I'm a bit surprised, but, um, but, but I'm interested in clothes, and so I, I, I also, I, I, I regard this as, um, as a pleasure, you know, not work, because you, usually you do talks as part of your work, but, um, so I, I think I should enjoy the evening. In fact, I'm actually surprised you choose this picture to put on your talk about fashion, because I was actually wearing what was, would be called the Mao suit. Um, um, and of course, it's not the usual idea of Mao suit, but it's the sort of women's version of the Mao suit. And what marks it as a, a so-called Mao suit is that um, the, it's all blue. I mean, everybody was wearing the same kind of blue. And you can't see this now, but with the baggy trousers and the sort of ill-fitting jacket. In fact, when, when I first came to Britain, and I was wearing things like that. I came with a group of 14 people, and we were all wearing the Mao suit. And in those days, 1978, we were not allowed to go out on our own. We had to move in a group. So we were quite a sight in the London streets. <laughs> you were in London, that's right. You we came as students yes. in 1978, and that's when you stayed. So you were about 25, 26 then and 26 <laughs> did, did you keep your Mao suit have you got one at home or, or have you got several I, I, I no I, I think it's gone now and I did keep it in a, in a suitcase but I think the moth chewed it um, I thought they were indestructible so. <laughs> that was meant to be the idea but this photograph I chose this photograph because I think it's absolutely delightful I can't work out the express, expression on your face whether in fact you're um, pleased to be leaving China or just um, and, and pleased to be going to, the, uh, to England what, what do you think Oh, I was very happy. I think that's very clear. <clears throat> Unlike the Mao suit, I mean, I was very happy. And um, this was 1978. Um, and I was able to come to England because Mao had died in 1976. So for the first time, scholarships for going abroad were awarded on academic basis. I sat for a national exam. I did reasonably well. So I became one of the first <clears throat> lot of first group of 14 people to come and study in Britain. Um, and, you know, when I got my doctorate in linguistics in 1982, I was the first person from communist China ever to get a doctorate from a British university. How long did it take you to feel comfortable changing clothes, getting out of your Mao suit and wearing Western clothes? Oh, I felt immediately <laughs> incredibly comfortable, of course. And I, 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 in fact, I felt um, um, completely comfortable when I arrived in London. Although, you know, London was like another planet. It was like Mars. Everything was different. Um, but I somehow felt this was a place I could let, put, let my hair down, put my feet up, and relax. And um, I was, of course, also intensely curious about everything. Um, and when I first came, we were under strict rules. We were not allowed to do this and that and the other. And we were particularly told not to go into an English pub uh, because the Chinese translation for pub is jiu ba, which in those days suggested somewhere indecent with nude women gyrating. <laughs> so we were told not to go to a pub, but of course I was torn with curiosity. And I, 
I knew there was a pub across the road from the college, and one day I sneaked out of the college. I darted across the road. Um, I pushed the door of the pub open, and of course I saw nothing of the kind. Only some men sitting there drinking beer. I was rather disappointed. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. But how, how long did, I mean, you are um, famous for being absolutely extraordinarily dressed every single time. You look amazing tonight, I've got to say. This is an, uh, an Isimiyaki um, designer uh, outfit, which is quite extraordinary. And I know that you wear um, traditional Chinese dress occasionally too. Um, and it's a very individual style you have. Um, so you've gone from the, the uniform, um, uniform uniforms of the masses, so to speak, to this very individual style. Um, it, was that a difficult inner choice for you? Or was that something you'd always felt? Anyway, you had your own style in spite of wearing the uniforms. Individual style is what I would like to have. I mean, I don't go with the fashion. Um, in fact, this Isimiyaki skirt and the blouse um, I've had for many, many years. But I sort of like to be a little, um, a little different. I, I think I was like that when I was in China, even when I was a child, and when I was an adolescent, even in the Cultural Revolution. You, you know, there were op endless opportunities to make the Mao suit look a little different. Now let's um, let's start our PowerPoint journey. <laughs> um, we both dislike PowerPoint, but we have absolutely got some wonderful images for you, and some of these have never been seen before. So we're going to start. We're going. To, it's chronological, and we're going to start with Wild Swans because that is, of course, um, Yong Chang's story as well. So if I can work this thing, there we are. There's the cover of Wild, Wild Swans. Swans. Now, when you came to write Wild Swans, you'd been in this country a, a decade already. Um, very briefly, why did you write this book? Had you, you'd written before, you'd written poetry and so on before when you were younger. Yes, um, but for 10 years, I didn't want to write this particular book because it, it would mean to look inward and backward into a past which I wanted to forget all about because there were a lot of tragedies um, in, in my family, in, in, before I left um, in China. Um, and I just wanted to forget all about those and just to enjoy Britain. Um, but then in 1988, 10 years after I came here, my mother came to stay with me. And so for the first time in our lives, she told me the stories of her life and stories of my grandmother. And once she started, she couldn't stop. She stayed with me for six months, and she talked every day. Uh, by the time she left London, she had left me 60 hours of tape recordings. Um, and when I was listening to my mother, and I kept saying to myself, I've got to write all this down. Um, and so after my mother left, I sat down, I transcribed the tapes, and I started writing. Um, and it was actually very quick. It took me um, only two years to write this book, whereas the, my next book, The Biography of Mao, took both me and my husband 12 years. And then, say she took eight years, I think, too. So this, this, was, yes. your, this was your quickie. The well, quickest book, because I think I had always wanted to be a writer, actually. I had suppressed this dream, but because in China it was impossible to be a writer, and all, nearly all writers were persecuted um, under Mao's tyranny. And so, but I was writing in my head with an invisible pen, so to speak. And so I, you know, all that was, um, came out very quickly. Now we've got um, some photos, that, that at the top there is your grandmother, and your mother in the middle, and you're at the bottom there. And here is, um, there are just some captions. We're going to tell you the story very quickly of each of each image. But this is 1939. Yes, uh, my my mother, my grandmother, um, my grandmother um, was a. When she was 15, she was given by her father to a warlord general to be his concubine. Um, my grandmother was married to him for six years. Um, but he left, uh, no, spent, but spent 
first spent six days with him, and then he left. He had many concubines around China. He only visited my mother, when, my grandmother, when he was next in town. Um, <clears throat> and then my mother was born. That's my mother. Um, um, then the warlord general was dying, um, and then my grandmother realized that she would lose her daughter once the world general died, because by tradition, the blood descendant had to be raised by the proper wife and not by a concubine. So my grandmother then took my mother and escaped. And very quickly, what are they wearing? Because, I mean, your mother or your grandmother is wearing the most extraordinary outfit. It almost looks like an isimiyaki. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, they were wearing very warm uh, you know, robes of the day. And my grandmother was later married to this uh, Dr. Xia, who was um, a Manchu doctor. And the picture was taken in Manchuria, and it was very cold, and they, they were all wearing padded, padded gowns. My mother was wearing a padded gown, I think. Um, and um, also Dr. Xia and his son and grandson. Fascinating. And this one, this is one that I chose because of what um, the, the, the grandmother's sister, your grandmother's sister is wearing, which is a very decorative um, outfit. It's, it's also padded? <coughs> yes, it looks that way. Although, I mean, uh, it may probably, yes, because she was also wearing sort of like leggings to keep warm. And this was again in Manchuria um, in 1946, before the communists came to power. So it was still possible for women to, it's not still possible, it was women's clothes um, of this kind of particular style. It's sometimes called the Chongsan, sometimes called the Qi Pao. But yes. And in fact, um, the one era we haven't um, got any photographs of is the whole 1920s era, which we think of very often as the, the Shanghai style. Um, and it was a really flamboyant, um, extravagantly dressing, um, dress time for women and for men too. Um, the kind of jazz age for Shanghai. <laughs> well, my grandmother was not in Shanghai. <laughs> Unfortunately, she was in this small town in Manchuria. So she would be wearing the kind of uh, um, gown she was wearing. Um, and, um, and, and the sort of you know, very Chinese style. Is there interest today in the costumes of the past in China itself? I know there is here, especially say in the Victorian Albert Museum there is, but, um, and, and other museums, but are, are Chinese people themselves becoming interested in their costume history? Um. Probably. Probably. Yes. <laughs> yes. Some you, you've do. Been, some, you've some, been here too much. <laughs> some, some don't. I can't speak uh, for them. Yes. Oh, well, this is my parents sort of wearing communist uniforms um, because my mother joined the communists when she was 15 and she was um, deeply affected by the sort of tragic life of my grandmother and she thought that she had this dreams about the communists bringing um, happiness to particular women because that's what the communists promised. So she joined the communists and she met my father, who was a communist officer um, in the army, besieging her cities. And once the communists took her city, they met, fell in love, and got married. And then they left Manchuria to go to Sichuan, where my father had come from. Um, the journey was a thousand miles long, and my father was a um, senior officer. So he was entitled to a jeep or a horse, whichever was available. And my mother was new to the revolution, so she had to walk. Um, my father wouldn't give her a lift because this was supposed to be uh, nepotism. The communists had vowed to get rid of nepotism. And as a result, my mother suffered a miscarriage on the way. And this photo was actually taken um, soon, um, so I soon after all, just, but just shortly before she had the miscarriage, but she was already very unhappy. So, I mean, she looked quite sort of a, a bit unhappy. I think, I think. I think the <laughs> word is, is wistful 
here, isn't it? And I, I mean, yes. describe these uniforms too, because mm. this is the communist army uniform. Yes. And these, what colour were these? Blue. Blue, also mm. blue. Yes. And where, where were they made? I mean, was in there, China. Somewhere in China. <laughs> <laughs> Even in those days. <laughs> I don't think do. we because I know imported there is... the uniform from anywhere. I mean, it's mm. sort of made probably... Um, uh, well, I think it's probably by hand, by sort of peasants, peasant swimming. Um, and, and what marked them out as uniform is that, you know, the red star on their mm. camp and also the badge they wear. And everybody had to have short hair, didn't they? And um, there were certain uniform that's right. regulations that everybody had to adhere to as well. Well, that's the kind of revolutionary fashion. My mother used to have very long hair, very thick long hair, but she, she cut it after she met my father. And so she was wearing the short hair. And also she was very unhappy because, as you can see, she was showing a little hair. And whereas, whereas communist soldiers were supposed not to show any hair at all, but they were in a place, Nanjing, which was very hot. And she nearly fainted from the heat. So she sort of, I think, I guess, you know, I hadn't thought of that. I guess this was a sort of gesture almost of defiance because my father kept telling her to, to cover her hair, but she sort of pushed it up. And is that why you have long hair? Maybe. It was easy in my subconscious, <laughs> I guess. Now, this is a few years before you were born. And then here is another favorite photograph of mine. There you are, age two. Yes. With I ribbons in your hair. That's, that's me. I mean, you I could recognize you, you anywhere. Recognize you, yes. <laughs> right. yes. There you are. Uh, with, my, with, my sis, with my siblings and my grandmother and my mother. And I think you probably would think that we were actually wearing quite nice clothes. And this was true because my family was very privileged because my father was a senior official. So <clears throat> I grew up in this privileged in, in environment of the communist elite. Um, you know, we had the chauffeurs and the cooks and the gardeners and so on. We lived in this armed compound. And so much so that when I first came to Britain, I thought Britain was wonderfully classless. And my views have been modified over the years, of course. <laughs> Indeed. And of course, I mean, as you say, there, you've got um, what would almost be considered quite Western clothes at that time, too. And I love the baby's bonnet. To any of us could have looked like that at that particular time. And then, of course, things changed. Now, this one is um, also... On the, on the cover of your book, actually, it's your age six, wearing a lovely floral um, blouse there, looking very cute indeed. <laughs> yes, we were, we were also but wearing very colourful clothes in the 1950s. So you, you loved that from the beginning? I, I loved that, yes. I, 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 I loved it. I loved clothes. <laughs> and how many years then did you have to dispense with fashion and clothes, I mean, during the Cultural Revolution, the 10 years? 10 years, ten years. yes, about 10 years. Yes. Okay, so this one actually is also my siblings um, and I with my mother. Um, we were, my sister and I were wearing these sort of um, colorful sweaters. Um, it's like Christmas sweaters now, isn't it? Or Norwegian sweaters almost. Yes. Well, they were very fine, I and mean, sort of very fine cashmere. Who made, who made them? Who would, who would make the sweaters? They were hand-knitted at home. Oh, no, I think those, we, um, I'm, I think you buy those, you bought those in those days in shops. Now, this is a special photograph, though, isn't it? Um, because your mother's hair is very unruly, um, very unusual, um, because yes. she, it was, everybody had to pose very quickly, didn't they, for yes. this photograph? Yes, we... Um, um, uh, this photograph was taken for my father to take to his mother. His mother actually had died. Um, and um, because her paternal grandmother was a Buddhist, the whole family was devout, were devout Buddhists. And, but my father was a communist. So he 
the fam and he was always trying to talk his sisters and so on out of believing in religion because Marx said, you know, religion was the opium of the people and all that. And so his family was worried that if he had come back, he would try to prevent them from having a Buddhist burial for his mother. And so they didn't even tell him. I mean, they only told him afterwards. And, um, but he, they didn't say his mother had died, and they said the mother was very ill. So my father raced back, um, taking, the, and he was very saddened. He was very, I mean, this, he told me the story in his later um, time when, when he had lost his faith. Um, and you can see also my brothers, what my two brothers were wearing sailor's suit. Um, and that was uh, Soviet influence because the Russians, you know, brought this sailor suit. And it was at a time when China and Russia were having good relations. And my mother's hair was, um, did, didn't sort of brush down um, because um, it was taken in a hurry. Now, this was a relatively happy time. Um, what happened to your brothers and sisters? Are they still alive today? Yes, they, they, are, they are still. Um, and your my, mother lives in, in China? My mother lives in China, my sister lives in China, and one brother lives in Canada, and one brother in London. Wonderful. Mm. Now, and also, the, this brother had this, I don't know whether you noticed, this handkerchief pinned oh, yes, yes. to his sailor suit. That's, um, right. that's, that's a common way to, to give handkerchiefs to boys, for them to wipe their nose. So they could be, <laughs> yes. <laughs> they could be a, bit, a bit snotty, as we say. <laughs> now, this, this is a photograph you asked me to... Um, well, I to, thought that, you know, it's I lovely. just thought it was, it was taken um, at the flower show with my siblings, and I thought I looked rather wicked. In fact, <laughs> uh, I, I think that was probably my idea of posing that for is camera. You, isn't it, there? <laughs> yes. Okay. No, it's lovely. So this is 1958 again, and so, and then... Okay, we get then this. the Cultural Revolution started in 1966, when I was 14, and I went with this other five girls to Beijing to see Mao, because Mao was like our god. And we were on Tiananmen Squ Square, and you can see with this army, um, soldiers who were sent to train us. I was I wearing think. what was called a Lenin suit, which was my mother's, which was an early 1950s fashion. Um, so it was, it's already You've gone. You've got all these patches on your huh? trousers, patches yes, on I your trousers. Yes, I put patches. I, I now can see some patterns on my trousers. <laughs> and it must have been something, in those days, we dyed our own clothes. And um, that's one way of making your clothes look slightly different. So I think I dyed my trousers into some kind of a messy pattern and put these patches on the trousers. I mean, it was a time when, you know, it was supposed to be the idea of uh, to make yourself look more proletariat. Uh, um, and so I put patches, which is sort of also different. But if you notice, we were all carrying the little red book. Um, and uh, um, some of, I, I think I was wearing a red scarf uh, of, of the young pioneers. I was 14. You were and a very uh, eager pioneer, eager, well, eager red guard. No, no, no. Well, I, thought, I, I thought you enjoyed we were, it. No, no, we, uh, that, that's the red guard armband. I was eager to join because everybody was one. And if you didn't join, um, it would mean peer group rejection. So I would say everybody was keen to join. But once, I mean, everybody was, was a red guard. But um, after you joined, after I joined, then violence and all these things started and I then left um, soon after we made this pilgrimage to Beijing to see Mao. And your love of Mao turned very quickly to um, dislike and anger with Mao. Oh. Um, now this is a, a very sad photograph. Uh, well, the thing, the thing is, in the Cultural Revolution, my, mother, my father was one of the few who actually s spoke up against the, um, the violence and the atrocities. 
so as a result, he was arrested, and tortured, driven insane. He was exiled to a camp and died very tragically and prematurely. Um, my mother was um, under tremendous pressure to denounce my father. Uh, she refused. Um, so she was put through over a hundred of those ghastly denunciation meetings, and she was made to kneel on broken glass. She was paraded in the streets where children spat at her and threw stones at her. And she was sent to this camp, um, but she survived. This was my mother. And in fact, she was only in her 30s, but you know she looked uh, much older. Um, and she was wearing what you know everybody else um, or other women were wearing in those days in summer, a uh, short-sleeved shirt. Mm. And kind of overall. No, it is, it is very... Did, when your mother spoke to you when she was in the UK and she, you recorded all those conversations with her, did she talk about this time and how, how it, the effect it had had on her? Yes, she did, um, you know, compared actually to what she went through um, those, of those denunciation meetings. And um, the camp was actually a relief, uh, a respite, because there um, you work. Um, and when she fir was first sent there, in, I think at the, in 1968, um, she wasn't allowed to, to rest after doing this heavy harm, farm work. And she had to stand there to receive sort of denunciations. Um, but uh, later on, you know, things became sort of less harsh and she was allowed to rest and people were very kind to her. And she remembered very, a lot of kind deeds in this period. And I remember going to the camps to see my mother and see also see my father, who was in another camp. Um, although their camps were very close, but they were not allowed to see each other. And so I wrote a passage which I liked very much um, in Wild Swans about seeing my mother on the New Year's, um, uh, during the New Year period. Um, and um, and, um, but, you know, the place they were sent to were of extraordinary beauty, um, but their, their life was, was very harsh. Even though if you think of it, um, Wild Swans is um, nearly 25 years old, as it is 25 years old, quarter of a century ago it was published, which is quite extraordinary. I remember reading it. My, my original paperback copy is there, actually, which took me many years to get Yong Chang to sign it because I didn't meet her for many years. But um, it had such an impact on all of us, uh, the insight that we all got into. It was the first book about that we many of us read about women in China and the struggles. Um, and it was told in historical terms, but also in a very personal way. Do you find it quite easy to talk about that now, or do you still feel the, the pain and the, the trauma? I feel quite easy to talk about it now, because I think somebody said, I don't, can't remember who, I mean, once you turned um, something into a narrative, and then you are kind of released from the trauma, so in a way, I am very lucky because I have managed to turn trauma into memory. So I can talk about it. And this is a luxury because most people in China of my generation um, are, um, have not got this luxury. I mean, I was in Beijing, you know, for example, Somebody gave me a dinner, and there, there was one man from the finance ministry. He was swaggering, he was very confident, you know, he was the big shot. And, um, and then we, we started talking about child, one's childhood. And in front of my eyes, this man changed. I mean, he was, um, he, obviously, the memory was so painful that he couldn't. Um, he was so abused in childhood that he couldn't, he was incoherent, he couldn't, um, he couldn't sort of, he, he couldn't sit still, and the, you know, he was, you know, he could well have collapsed. Um, I saw so many cases like this. Um, so I'm very lucky that I've written Wild Swans. And also, I mean, the fact that Wild Swans 
actually isn't published in China. So, um, not, I mean, published in China. Not published. It's banned. Not, yes. It's banned. It's banned like, so, um, we, we have the benefit. With my other books, <laughs> yes. Yes, uh, which is, it, it is extraordinary if you think of the impact it's had on the West, or the, you know, all three of your books have had on the West, but um, the fact that they can't have the impact on China. And, and I remember myself when I've been to China a few times, and the, the one great difficulty people have is talking about the past and um, you know, whether it's the Cultural Revolution or um, Civil War or the Communist period, but um, which is very okay. sad. Now, this is your army <laughs> training. Well, yes, this picture was taken in 1974. Do you want to, because okay. I'm in, not very good um, at identifying um, in which uniform. I can see you there. Then. Um, well, first of all, my family scattered and I was exiled to the edge of the Himalayas and worked as a peasant and then as a barefoot doctor. And then I was, I became a steel worker and an electrician. And there was no did you know, training. Did you know how to do any of those things? Well, I used to know. I mean, John, my husband, once said, oh, I, well, he was trying to change plug. He said, oh, I pay somebody five pounds to change this for me. <laughs> I said, pay me. <laughs> this is when we first met. I was the electrician. But I had five electric shocks in one month. And this was because there was no training, because Mao had said, the more books you read, the more stupid you become. So I became a dog, barefoot doctor, I became a steel work, I became an electrician without any training. And then in 1973, things were noticeably better and universities began to reopen after having been closed for six, seven years, since 1966. So I I was lucky enough to get into Sichuan University to learn English, but we, um, oh yes, uh, but we 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 spent most of our time doing things like army training. C can I mean, you this actually is the use? Army training. Can you use a gun? And we were actually all carrying a gun each, um, but mine is rather invisible. I'm <laughs> can to say it because I was I was dying to drop it, um, and um, I mean the thing is. Um, um, we were in this army training, which I hated um, every minute of it, and uh, I was also a lousy shot. Um, and uh, when the, the shooting kind of exam came, mine was so bad and that none of the bullets hit the, the board, the target. The target. Um, so everybody was uh, surprised and said that the gun barrel must be bent. <laughs> <laughs> but in the university, you know, I was there at a time when China was completely closed to the outside world. And even our English language teachers had never seen the foreigner themselves. So our textbooks were direct translations of Chinese texts. And um, I remember the... Uh, and you were an English student. We were so. English language students. I mean, in those days, in China, but remember the lesson greetings. In those days in China, when we bumped into each other, we said, which means, Where are you going? Have you eaten? So those were the English greetings that I learned. <laughs> <laughs> so when I first came to London, I used to go around and ask people where they were going, whether they had eaten. <laughs> Now we're going to move on a, a little bit. This is again this lovely oh, photograph. Right. So there so you go, we'll, off to the UK. Okay. Oh, uh, the, the, this is um, after I finished. This writing. is welcome to the West, I would think. This it was like 1990. No, this is after I finished writing uh, yep. Wild Swans, and it was about to be published. And John and I took a holiday. Um, no, I've seen Yorkshire a bit of writing about... Wild Swans. I think my mother left in. Uh, no, no, sorry, it was a writing. So nothing to do with wild swans, just a straightforward holiday in Italy. But it is a wonderful photograph. It does look as though you've just stepped out of Vogue magazine. And the contrast between that, the photograph before and this one, where you're wearing a loose shirt and sunglasses and a, a very strange hat, I may say, but um, looks, oh, well. a bit, looks a bit warm for the, um, for the sunny 
Well, I, yeah, I think it's some, time some uh, journalists that did say look like straight out of Vogue, but in fact, the, the shirt was a man's shirt, was my husband's shirt. We were having holiday um, in Italy. This was a holiday snapshot. I, I had these um, cheap glasses, sunglasses bought uh, at the market, and also the hat was also bought on the market. So this, you, you, but you, the you, line. you took, you mm. took, um, you, you then took to Western clothing and mm. um, individual clothing very, very quickly and very happily. I know. I mean. Did you make your own clothes? Did you did, did you make your own clothes? Because oh, no, no. I'm absolutely no good with no, the, no good. With, with my hands. No. Let's move on to this. Now, very quickly, we've got quite a few photographs and very little time, unfortunately. Well, the thing is, well, then I, after Wild Swans, I wrote this biography of Mao with John, my husband, and we divided our research by language. Um, uh, I'm, because I'm Chinese, so I dealt with the Chinese language sources. And Zhang, um, Zhang's half English, half Irish, and unfortunately, he speaks many languages, so he was landed with the rest with of the of world. <laughs> but and, you, but you, we had great fun writing the book. And you interviewed all kinds of people, like Kissinger and so on, too. Yeah, this is a really major Anyone who major had study. interesting dealings with Mao, yeah. Now, mm -hmm. basically, this is a... It is what you call the unknown story of Mao, and um, one of the um, many unsavory um, aspects of, of Mao. This is, I don't know if you probably recognize Imelda Marcos, but... Um, well, this is actually one of his more savory moments. Uh, and <laughs> Mao, Mao I mean, he was responsible for the death of over 70 million Chinese. That's the worst. Now, but he was also a womanizer. When he met Imelda Marcos um, in 1974, Mao was nearly blind. Um, but when he saw Imelda, you know, dressed, this is not a good photo, but dressed in this glorious Filipino national costume, um, his eyes sparkled and he, you know, he sort of uh, took up the, um, Imelda's hand and kissed it. And Mao's photographer was so astonished that he didn't dare to take a photograph because this gesture of a man kissing a woman's hand was condemned as a bourgeois habit. And anyone who indulged in that would have been subjected to denunciation meetings. Um, so he didn't dare to take a photograph, but the newsreel camera kept running and recorded this moment of Mao um, sort of flirting with uh, Imelda Marcos. So we have this unique one in our photo, in our book. By the way, when we interviewed Imelda Marcos, um, and she was in full flow for five hours. Um, she was also um, batting um, her eyelashes uh, furiously at John, my John. <laughs> And, um, and uh, then she then turned to me and said, oh, you know, Western men simply don't understand us Eastern women. Um, so John said, um, what, uh, uh, have you come across any Western men who understand you? She said, only one person, Richard Nixon. I wouldn't have boasted about that. <laughs> oh, yeah, what was the important thing about ah. visit to, yes. to fashion? Um, Madame Mao got very jealous, um, and then um, because she could only wear, you know, baggy trousers, this sort of Mao uniform thing, and so she came up with the idea of designing a national costume for Chinese women, and and um, the the skirt she designed was terrible. I mean, even fashion-starved women. Uh, <laughs> met it with universal duration. <laughs> um, but it did mean that we could wear skirt. Um, I remember the moment when I started to wear skirt again after 10 years in 1975. And that's thanks to Madame Mao. Uh, Imelda Marcos. And Imelda yeah. Marcos, indeed. Yeah. Now, um, we, we've only okay. got about 10 minutes to go oh, okay. through these pictures, but okay. this is, um, for me, this for me was one of the most extraordinary discoveries, reading this wonderful book um, about the Empress Dowager Seishi. And 
because I didn't know much about this woman and the research you did, you went into the Forbidden Palace, you went into the archives, you spent years and years researching the life of this woman and in fact changing people's views about her because she had, if any reputation, she had a very conservative reputation, very despotic. Um, she was the, the ruler of, um, of China basically behind the scenes for nearly 50 years during the time of Queen Victoria as well. So, I mean, how did you discover her and why were you so, um, why did you want to spend so many years of your life writing about her? Yes, I, was, I was fascinated um, by her because I didn't know much about her um, before I started research in 2007. Um, all I heard was uh, she was, was wicked, she was bad, you know, whatever the, the, the things you said. Um, but the little bit I knew, um, uh, which I'll mention late, later, um, made me feel that she wasn't what these people um, uh, made her out to be. And so I wanted to find out, and the, to write a book was the best way to find out about her. Now, um, this, this, is, these, this book mm. is where you'll find the, the richest descriptions of clothing and makeup and flowers and decor and um, ceremonial dress. And this is the imperial yellow, which yes. um, is on this is the front of the book. And these wonderful shoes, two very, very high shoes, In, square toes. You see these little pearls, strings of pearls draping. Um, and also this sort of Manchu, because she was a Manchu. China's last imperial dynasty was a Manchu dynasty, and they were about 1% of the Chinese population. And they, they sort of conquered China uh, in the 17th century. I mean, they have this sort of headdress um, I mean, on which you put all sorts of jewelry, but she particularly liked red, uh, like uh, fresh flowers. So that was a sort of a why that there was a big, I think, rose um, on her headdress. And what about her and fingers, her, her nails? Fingers. Yes, I mean, she had this, um, you know, long fingernail shields to protect very long fingernails on the last two fingers of each hand. I mean, somehow, you know, and you actually don't need those two fingers. Those are the two useless fingers. <laughs> but, and also all these Manchu um, uh, aristocracy, uh, they, they don't put on their clothes. They didn't put on their clothes themselves. They've got servants to help them. Um, and so they were all growing these very long fingernails and protected by these bejeweled fingernail shields, which is, I think, another way of wearing more jewelry. Now, say she was a, a concubine, mm -hmm. um, and she was one of the many concubines um, in the, uh, see, the 19th century um, of Emperor Zhang Feng. And this is a, a wonderful portrait of the monarch. We'll move on to that one. And this is... This, I love this story of the dog, but it's not, it's, is this the sleeve, we haven't got the time, it's, but there is this story about the sleeved, the sleeved dogs, are they the called? Pekinese. The Pekingese. The Pekingese dogs, are where she bred and she sort of had beautiful costumes made, um, but I, And they for, used to carry them dogs. in their sleeves. Um, but actually this particular one, now that we're here, this particular one was actually owned by Queen Victoria. Um, because the Emperor um, Cixi's husband um, was driven out of Beijing by British invasion, led by Lord Elgin, you know, the son of the Elgin marble repute or disrepute. And, and, the, um, and um, the Emperor left and Lord Elgin burned down the summer palace, this gorgeous palace compound, and so on. So that emperor was so heartbroken, um, and he died in self-imposed exile in the northern wilderness. Um, and then so she launched a coup at the, uh, okay, we'll, we'll have that for one moment. But the, when, the, um, when Lord Elgin's men got into the Forbidden City, the, the Summer Palace, they saw some Pekingese dogs around the body of an elderly imperial concubine who didn't manage to escape with the emperor. And so the British took them back, and that's how Pekingese started to grow here. 
and one of them was this one, the other, the one was named Luti and was presented to Queen Victoria and Queen Victoria had the picture painted. And it was and, a parallel period as well. And the, the interesting thing about Seishi is that even though she was a concubine, she was only half educated as well, half literate, um, but the, the rules um, about concubines were very, very strict in what they could wear and how they could behave, and there were several of them. But because she gave birth to a son, she rose up the ranks very quickly and was able then to rule instead of the son, basically pulling the strings um, of the son and the, um, the adopted son as well. Um, for many, many years. So, um, th This is her son, um, the, the boy in blue. Um, he was the only son, and he was by Cixi. So Cixi rose from, as you say, a low, lowly concubine to basically the number two. And, um, and as soon as her husband died, Cixi launched a coup and ousted eight the eight sort of imperial regents appointed by her husband. And she launched the coup with, came to the next picture, when, mm -hmm. with the empress. I mean, that's the empress. And although these two women lived in this harem, which was supposed to be a place of backbiting, you know, people uh, stabbing each other's back, they were actually great friends. And they were comrades in launching this coup. Um, and uh, they changed China because they opened the door of China. And also, the coup was remarkably bloodless. I say bloodless. They put three people, three of the eight regions, to death. And one was executed. The other two were each sent a long white silk scarf to hang themselves with. And, but after that, they opened the door of China. And she was wearing, the, the empress was wearing a kind of casual dress for the court, and whereas she was wearing the formal one, and here is a, a casual dress. Absolutely here. beautiful. And of course, there were lots of portraits painted, lots of drawings done. And see, she herself was a, a great um, painter, artist. She, she was a very, yes, very um, gifted yeah. woman in so many different areas. Mm -hmm. Let's move on. Now, okay. this is. Now she, they, no, she doesn't <laughs> smile very much, does she? If at no, all. <laughs> she sort of put on a sort of uh, awesome uh, kind of expression for the camera. Um, and uh, she was carried to the morning audience by eunuchs. And all these men were eunuchs in the Forbidden City. The men were one emperor and all the hundreds of others were eunuchs. And um, when she first came to power, so she uh, in her late 20s and then in, early 30, in her early 30s, fell in love with uh, a young, good-looking eunuch. Quite a difficult relationship to consummate. Well, I mean, I there think. are ways. Um, <laughs> and, but, you know, this was supposed to be um, so kind of devastating a scandal. So the grandees, um, this was also the earlier days of her reforms. The grandees then had the eunuch arrest, arrested and, um, and executed and beheaded and uh, had his body exposed in public for days, you know, for people to supposedly to see that he had no you know, male organ, because there was already rumor that the Empress Dowager was having an affair with, with this man. But the crime they were com he was supposed to have committed was that Tsushi sent him out of the Forbidden City, because eunuchs were imprisoned in the Forbidden City. And Tsushi so loved this man, and wanted to just to give him the chance to go out of the Forbidden City. So he sent him out of the Forbidden City and out of the capital, Beijing, and took a boat from Beijing uh, down to the south, near Shanghai, on this great canal, so he could celebrate his birthday on the grand boat, you know, under a moon. And, and all that was deemed so horrible. And so this man was killed, this eunuch was killed, the entourage were um, executed, and so she suffered a very bad nervous breakdown. 
She's, she certainly um, suffered a lot because she was also very... I'm going to whiz through a few of these because this is a very important story yes. um, to tell because this is one of the great, um, if you like, the great achievements of Sashi. Yes. I mean, she opened the door of China to the West and she brought China from a medieval um, society um, um, society into the modern age and everything we have you know the electricity the the train the modern army and navy the educational system and the legal system which existed in the west in 19th century was brought into china by the Empress Dowager. And she also launched the women's liberation and the banned foot binding. I mean, you can see these women with tiny bound feet. And this is how I got interested in her. Um, I just wanted to, the, the moment I got interested in her was when I was researching wild swans, because my grandmother had bound feet. and. Um, and I wanted to show you. I wanted to show you my grandmother's shoe. You know, she was my size, and yet her feet were this big, because foot binding was not just to put a piece of cloth around the feet. Only the big toe was allowed to grow, and the other four toes and the arch were crushed under a big stone. And the binding was just to stop the broken bones from recovering. Um, so from the age of two, my grandmother lived in excruciating pain, which I witnessed when I was a child. And then when I was doing my research for wild swans more than a quarter of a century ago, and I suddenly realized that um, foot binding was banned by the Empress Dowager, um, by Cixi. I mean, this was so different from his, her image of being this archi-conservative, cruel despot, and so on. And then so I, that's how I got interested. I wanted to know more and, about her. And neither you nor your mother um, had to go through that, of course. It was, no, it was because, uh, you know, she banned it. Um, yes. And she sort of released women from homes and gave them education and uh, so on. Um, then in 1903, in Sashi's reforms, she had her photographs taken. And this photograph was taken in 1903. But when the photographer saw the prints, he was worried that the Empress Dowager would not like it because Sashi looked her age, which is she was nearly 70. And if you see the photograph uh, before, so the, the, the um, the photographer then um, did, um, what is it, touched it's up. Photo touched Photoshop. Up, <laughs> the, touched up the, the photographs, erased the bags, ironed out the, the, um, the, the wrinkles. Um, and so, so she looked, you know, a woman in her broom. And this, and so when she saw the pictures, she was thrilled. She had them blown up to giant sizes and hung them all over the Forbidden <laughs> City. And she selected some, including this one, to give to foreign heads of state um, after they congratulated her on her 70th birthday. And this one was given to the American president. And when the picture arrived in Washington, American newspapers said the Empress Dowager looked 40, not 70. And even today, I think because my, my book's banned there, people are still studying what is the trick of the Empress Dowager for keeping her youth. Um, and actually, it's Photoshop. <laughs> you do, though, in the book, give some absolutely wonderful and long descriptions about how she um, prepared herself every day. It took her two hours to get ready every day, um, and she'd have to get up about five o'clock in the morning um, in order to start preparations. Um, and then she'd change during the day several times as well, and would have different, kind, different clothes for being at home or in the harem, and, uh, and then for ceremonial life as well. And the, 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 the next, the, the previous um, 
photograph you can see. I mean, they, they, she didn't see this one. She only saw the ironed out, the photoshopped ones. I mean, in this one, she looked her age, and also she was putting a flower in her in her headdress, and the, you know, she was sort of posing for the camera. And she herself. loved flowers, yes. didn't she? She loved mm. flowers. She loved music. Yes. She loved. Um, she made her own rouge as well. Yes. Um, and the detail you go into about how how she had to have a different pair of socks every day, and the shoes and the pearls on the shoes and the different layers on yes. the clothes. Yes, you see, as well. she was very unfortunate because in China in those days, a widow was not allowed to wear makeup. Um, so she couldn't wear makeup, but she, could, she would wear it very discreetly um, to, to, you know, to make herself look, look better. Can you imagine not wearing makeup or <laughs> at all? <laughs> now, there's that great picture. And the, the other thing that she was very aware of um, European clothes by this time, but she preferred um, Chinese clothes because that she thought she thought it was rather strange how we, um, how they weren't flattering to our bodies. European clothes weren't flattering to our bodies, whereas the Chinese dress would cover up all, all um, evils, if you like, of body shape. Yes, well, they, those Chinese gowns, which I actually have, I mean, but I didn't wear today. I mean, it's absolutely wonderful because, you know, you look good if you have put on a little weight. You look good if you are thin. You know, you don't have to, you know, you didn't have to wear these sort of very tight um, um, corsets in, in her days, um, as women in the West did, which she didn't like at all. Um, and you could feel very comfortable. Um, so I wish we could, you know, still... We, I mean, I would only wear this sort of thing on special occasions. I wish, you know, there was a time. I, I wish we can still wear those dresses um, for more ordinary occasions as well. well. You, you can, you may, <laughs> we, we, we can't. But it, it's interesting, or we can less with less authority, I think. But it's interesting how we've come full circle, really, because at the very beginning we spoke about individualism and love of beauty and, and so on. And, uh, and here she is expressing great individuality as well, also with her flowers, against the, the ritual and the order of the day to a certain degree. Not necessarily here, but she was a great individual herself, wasn't she? And she loved to see people in beautiful clothes and looking, yes. looking well-dressed. Can you quickly, if you quickly sure. bring to the book cover, um, she introduced the flowers to the audience hall. Um, because before her time, um, or the, here we don't see flowers. In the previous one, you see flowers. Um, but I mean, to, to, in order to for the audience hall to look awesome, to look, you know, authority, um, to have authority, and flowers were banned. And actually, she introduced them. But for her quarters, she used fresh fruit, apples, for example, pears, um, uh, peaches, to to give the scent. Um, she liked very faint scent. She also make her own um, perfume. I just want to do justice to the wonderful writing of this book, just to give you a very short flavour of um, the description of Shi Shi, one of Shi Shi, um, Shi Shi's rituals in her dressing room. There was not much she could do to her face. As a widow, she was not supposed to wear makeup. Otherwise, Manchu ladies painted their faces excessively white and pink and had a vivid patch of red on their lower lip to produce a cherry-like small mouth, considered beautiful in those days when wide lips were deemed ugly. Longing to use a little makeup, Sheshi would discreetly apply a touch of rouge on her cheeks and on the center of her palms, even a little on her lips. The rouge used in the court was made with roses that grew in the, the, roses that grew in the hills west of Beijing. The petals of a certain rose were put in a stone mortar and crushed with a white marble pestle. A little alum was added, and the dark red liquid thus produced was poured into a rouge jar through fine white gauze. Silk wool was cut into small square or round pads and placed in the jug for days to soak up the, soak up the liquid. The silk pads were then dried inside a room with a glass window to avoid catching dust before ending up on the royal dressing table. Say she would dab the pad with lukewarm water before applying it. For her lips, she would roll up a pad or twist one around a jade hairpin to form a kind of lipstick. 
and daub the rouge in the centre of her lips, more on the lower lip than the upper. For perfume, she mixed the oils of different flowers herself. The palace also made its own soap under Shashi's direction. The maids would show her the paste that would eventually solidify into a soap, and she would vigorously stir it herself. And on it goes. This, this detail, this beauty, and if you think, just look at a lipstick today. We don't have to do anything. She made her own lipsticks, made her own perfumes, made her own soaps. Absolutely extraordinary detail. Wonderful, wonderful book. Um, she was absolutely remarkable. I, I, you know, some critics think that's not a good idea, uh, but I did sort of fall in love with her. Um, but I did also fall. Uh, I did. I. Um, it's not. I, I. I like both of my subjects, Mao and Sashi. You like Mao. But Mao only as a good subject, um, but Sashi also as an extraordinary stateswoman and a woman. Well, Yung Chang, you yourself are a remarkable subject, and thank you very, very much indeed. Again, it's been such a pleasure to talk with you, and thank you for coming to the Victoria and Albert Museum, and thank you to everyone else. Thank you. Thank you.